Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Barsha, Barsha, Barsha. We are live streaming on YouTube. We're here on Fireside. It's July 11th, 5 p.m. EDT in this part of the world. And as usual, my guest on Barsha, 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 I write a little Broadway um, song where I plug their name in, and here I go. Where do you go on Mondays when you want to have fun? Where can you go on Mondays when your day is done? Well, Fireside Chat is where it's at. Our guests are all the best. So join me in welcoming a real soul man, Terry Woolman. Welcoming Terry Woolman. Even though I know the syllable is not correct. <laughs> I had to. That was uh, awesome. Well, I, <laughs> I had to rhyme Woolman, and I just thought, well, whatever. Okay, <laughs> Terry. Hi, Deborah. Um, Thank for those you. of you that don't know, uh, and uh, that Terry has his own show on Fireside called Making It with Terry Woolman. That's what he has. And I have tuned in, whether live or on replay, for a lot of Terry's shows. Okay. Terry, can you, in a, in a sentence or so, before I introduce you formally in your bio, tell us why you created this Fireside show and why you called it Making It? The show, um, I created the show prior to moving it to... Actually, it was Center Talk Media, and, and they were the ones who invited me originally to, to create a podcast. And when they invited me, right. I, um, I gave it some thought as to what I would want to do to make it different and uniquely mine. And essentially, and I got together with a, a film TV director that I work with, uh, Danny Gold, and, and he... Um, we brainstormed it and he said, well, what do you, what's the show about? And I said, it's about the process. It's about creativity. It's about passion, integrity. It's about the life of a creative, not necessarily just us musicians, but right. creatives in, in any form, lawyers, you know, mothers, anything, you know, it's this, cause it's the same story and everybody has a story. Of course, I slant towards creative artist because that's what you and I do. Um, but it's really about the journey. So yeah. that's what the show's about. And basically the the name making it was essentially for me, you know, it's so interesting because I always my closing one of my three closing questions that I ask all of my guests is what does making it mean to you? Um because I'm always curious about that. But uh but essentially it's really it's just about the journey to me. Right. That's what making it is. Right. Um, and because it's in that tense, you know, making, it's, co it's a constant process. It's, it's not past tense. It's not made it. And, right. and the people that I feature on my show, as you do on yours, are people yes. who are successful and not necessarily financially successful. Many of them are extremely financially successful, but they're successful in having a, 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 a powerful, meaningful life. That's beautiful. Yes. So it's yeah. So it's a present tense, or it's it's an action to me. It's an action. Yes. And, and everybody who I ask on my show has a different answer for what making it is. So I which, do. And, I know. I, I actually knew the answer to that question, but I'd like you to say it anyway because I think it's such a great me. idea. Um, <clears throat> now I'm going to. How did you come up with Barsha Barsha <laughs> and the third Barsha, which is very powerful? This is good. We're co-hosts, so we can ask each other. Um, I always used to say my name is Deborah Barsha, but I prefer to be called Barsha because I like the last name Barsha, and my father had four girls. And there's going to be no more Barshas. So I said, it, when, I sh when I go around in my theater um, you know, jobs, I always say, just call me Barsha. Yeah. And they go, Barsha, Barsha, Barsha. <laughs> they immediately do it. I don't know oh. why the whole world knows about the Brady Bunch. I have no idea. <laughs> You know, in this day and age, because that was right. a show from the seventies. I, I need to I need to go over your bio here because it's okay. insanely impressive. And I've been delving into the music part of it. And as you know, we all have a lot of labels. I said 
composer, producer, but there's so many labels you have. Even though I don't love labels, you have to present yourself in the world. They're helpful. Okay? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Although they can be very um, limiting and restrictive. Okay, so here, well. let's just talk about it in this moment on this day and where your head is at today and your heart. Mm -hmm. If I had to put those labels in order, guitar player, composer, performer, what order today, I'm not saying it would change tomorrow, would those be in? It would change tomorrow, and it was different yesterday. Yesterday I was a guitar player. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say artist, producer. Uh, and I, I would say artist first because of just the life, mm -hmm. um, the lifestyle. And um, but the producer, composer, arranger, guitarist, you know, those things continually shift positions yes. um, by the hour. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that is and, true. And you know, you know, one of the the reasons I'm excited to talk with you is because we're both music directors. So we both understand what it's like to wear many hats simultaneously yeah, and to be able to switch those hats. Quickly. And do what's needed. Do what's right. needed. To be solution oriented, not, not blame oriented when something goes wrong. You just like, you could deal with how did that happen later, but it's like, yeah. So for me, artists sort of encompasses for me, all of uh, that. And, and my mentors, by the way, the people that I wanted to be, or that I that showed me that it was possible were Quincy Jones, Dave Grusin, you know, Joe Sample. Oh yeah. Um, who was a personal mentor to me because I worked with him in the 80s and he played on my early records and and really showed me what it takes to be a great artist. Okay. And that, that encompasses that is, all of those things. That is an amazing answer to put artist first, because as we know. Artist is not necessarily determined by uh, who hires you. No. It's who you are and and in the world, you know? And then we, we well, I want to go back on your journey. This is very, you're, you're very similar. We don't know each other that well. No, we don't. We have mutual but connections. Musicians, you, yeah, we have mutual connections, but there's also a thing with the language of music. I mean, anyone who's listening who's not a musician, I, I want you to identify, but there is this weird thing when you listen to someone's music, you go, oh, okay, I, I see. Now, I want to just say, you listen to the eclectic background of Terry Woolman, okay? So you perform with Billy Preston, Dionne Warwick, Al Jarreau, Little Richard, Wilson Phillips, Joan Baez, Eartha Kitt, Joe Walsh, Keb Moe, and Melissa Manchester. Now listen, that's that's a variety, a smorgasbord of, of styles. So let me ask you this. I know what you're going to say because you're an artist. Whatever you do with those artists, you bring yourself to, and you also try to tune into where they're coming from. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, we, we share that that perspective because I know that you do as well. I serve the music, you I serve, serve the, the song, I serve the artist, whether it's my song or your song or Melissa or Kevmo or anybody. I it's, also happen yeah. to know from listening to your music that you're very spiritual. You have your own spiritual belief, I can tell. Because Why would you, you say that? That's interesting. Uh, because of a couple of things I listened to, which we'll talk about later, but okay, also, great. Be, yeah, because... Um, of your vibe, mm. that you you respect your gift. Let's just put it that way. You respect your honor, gift, yeah. and and it's about serving. So yeah. you do respect your gift. You're now, accurate about that. I, I want you to know, everybody, that it's not just individual artists, which we will ask Terry about, but he also did hit television shows. Now, I'm going to name the shows, and I kind of want you to tell me if you did the same thing or different things on them. Married with Children, Scrubs, Desperate Housewives, and my one of my favorite all time documentaries. If you're not in the obituaries, eat breakfast. Oh, right there, right there. Can we start that, with that? Since let's start with that one. Yeah, that was, as you know, and and as our listeners know, you know, all of you who are, who are joining us, there are moments in life that you just know are are just grand. They're special. They're they're just those moments that you're just so proud to to be a part of. Right. And that was one of those. Um, I've been fortunate to have many. Um, they're not all that way, as we know. Um, right. But but that being a part of that movie, that was with Danny Gold. And it was after we did that movie that I, that I had the opportunity 
to do the to to host my own podcast on yes. Intertalk. And so I reached I reached out to Danny because he's very creative and as an idea person, as a director and producer. Um, but anyway, that movie, it's so interesting. I, that came about. Here's why you always want to be open to saying yes to something. You know this really well. That might not be what you were thinking about or right. that you're not sure is the right thing. I was asked to um, to play guitar and mandolin and be the um, associate conductor for a play called uh, When You're in Love, the Whole World is Jewish. And it was Jason Alexander directed it. And is that where you know Deborah Hurwitz from? Deborah was the one who hired me to, I was recommended through JT Hornstein, who's a New York choreographer. I I love JT. JT. By the way, I produced JT's solo album. If you've never heard him sing, Oh, yourself. I've heard him saying, I okay. worked with, listen, I, Got it. this is okay. a, something we have to talk about offline, but go ahead. Later. Yeah. But anyway, so Deborah Hurwitz, uh, basically we met, you know, we did the long distance phone calls and met and it seemed like a great match. And right. so I was in Deborah's band and then there were a couple of days where she wasn't able to make it. So I took over the conductor chair, but it was in a, you know, a 99 seat theater. And, right. but it just seemed like a really cool thing to do. Um, the director of, no, not the director. Jason Alexander was the director who was just magnificent. He's such a, a, a completely um, well-rounded artist. Like, you know, he's he's everything. He's a musician, an actor, can juggle martial arts. Like, you know, he's he's a vaudeville I mean, guy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And a great guy. I love him. Right. So I wanted, <clears throat> I thought it'd be great to work with Deborah. I was excited about that, um, to do the show. And so we did it. It turns out that the one of the producers was all, ended up directing this movie. If you're not in the Obiti Breakfast, he was. We had become friends from the experience, you know, doing the show, and over a year and putting it up in a couple different cities and things. And basically, he said, "I'm doing this documentary. Here's what it's about. It's about people in their 90s and older, some celebrities, some not, who are all living vital lives." interesting vital lives and so i knew about it just as a friend and right. then he called me one day and he said i have a question for you i've been interviewing dick van dyke who was one of the people in, in the movie and he said um dick's always singing and dancing you know just that's all the time you know with his wife by himself everything and uh would you be able to arrange and produce a song if if we asked him to sing in the movie and i said absolutely Oh, I would great. I would love to. I would need to meet with him to to just talk about keys and voice and point of view and songs and and you know with all of us but yes the answer is absolutely yes I'll put a band together. So we we met and had this wonderful experience. Picked the song, picked the key. I did the arrangement. We went to Capitol Studios. They filmed it so the band is on camera for that which was just That's really right. a huge treat. Yeah. World Club, just great great band and 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 then um, out of that came the opportunity to produce Tony Bennett. Oh, my we God. We flew to New York, and I, I co-produced Tony Bennett with Dave Bennett, his son. And then, <sighs> and then also, then we came back and w- worked with Alan Bergman and Dave Grusin mm. to record the closing song you know, for the, yes. the movie, the original song that they wrote. Also, again, on camera, went back to Capitol to do that. So... And then got to meet, you know, go to the screening and and then meet some of the people in the movie, celebrities and non-celebrities. And and it was just, everybody needs to see this movie. It's just so incredible. Oh, if you so have not incredible. seen this, Carl Reiner, I mean. Carl, yeah, Carl is the moderator. Mel the, Brooks. Yeah. I mean. And it, it, it was just absolutely beautiful. Absolutely okay. exquisite that, movie. So that's yeah, that. No, yeah. Thank HBO, you. HBO. So- Emmy nominated, and I was so honored to be a part of it and to to end up producing like this trifecta of these amazing artists and one including Dave Grusin, one of the people who I you know oh, yeah. I call out as a mentor, you know, because oh, yeah. because he was a composer. He and no, he had his own record his, label. He had and his no, own record label, composer, producer, magnificent pianist, you know, you know. Oh and, God, yeah. And like, can you know when people go? Yeah, but you're uh, this. You're right. you're a guitar player, so you can't conduct a band. You are uh, this, so you shouldn't be able to do that. It's like, watch me. Right. 
Now let's, that's, you just segue to where I want to go. Okay, so you went to college at Berkeley, which I told you a long time ago, that I wanted to go to Berkeley, but there were no women there at the time. And you said, you're right, there were three. <laughs> yeah, there were three. <laughs> well, there might have been seven, but I knew three of them. And we're going way back, everybody. We're going back. We are. To 1976. Okay, yeah. so anyway... Um, but I wanted to go to Berkeley because it was better than Eastman's. I love Eastman School of Music, but the fact yeah. is, that's not who I was. I was a singer songwriter. Yeah, and you know, blah blah blah. Okay, so training. So yeah. you just so what were you trained as, and what was your degree in? I left school. I didn't get my degree, but I'm I don't care. So, but tell me your experience at Berkeley, and then we're going to fast forward. Okay. By the way, nobody's ever asked to see my degree, which I find kind of... Me either. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it gets held against you, I think, per perhaps if you don't have one. But if you do, nobody really cares. Um, I, I got a degree in arranging. Um, wow. So I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in arranging from Berkeley. I studied guitar. Of course, I had started studying voice there as well a little bit. Uh, right. but, but very focused on learning to really learn my instrument, you know, to, to learn guitar on a much deeper level, stylistically as well, yes, as yes. well as technically, um, because yeah. I, I didn't go there. I'm not a protege. You know, I didn't grow up like out the gate, just being this brilliant young, could do anything guy. I have a lot of tenacity and determination and hunger to, and I love music. I have a gift, but but the but I also train really hard and continue to. So, right. but I always wanted to produce music um, as well. It's just something I really enjoy. I also wanted to just. I never in my mind had this idea of me being an artist. As a matter of fact, I was too shy. You know, so for me to be like on TV, like leading a, a late night talk show band, or or having you know my picture on the front of an album, I my goal is to be the guy in the back of the record when you flip it over. Look it up yes. for you, young Remember ones. Remember when we used to read <laughs> album liner we, notes? Right. And I, I always, yes. And so for me, my goal is to be one of the, where would say, guitar Terry Wallman, song written by Terry Wallman or co-written by Terry Wallman, arranged, strings arranged by Terry Wallman, produced by Terry Wallman. That, um, that's how I envision myself. Um, I had zero desire to be in front of the stage. I wanted to be touring, like with Billy Preston, my very first tour. Yes. I was the guitar player. I mean, what a thrill. Oh, God. And what a learning experience. I mean, you just to get shot out of a cannon. Yeah. <clears throat> that was that was that experience. But how old were I, you? <clears throat> well, it's 1981. I was wow. like in my early 20s. I was probably 22, 20, maybe 23. Yeah. That was yeah, the age of my I'm, first tour, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 65 now. So you can all do the math if you want to backtrack on that. <laughs> And then you punch in the how old I was, <laughs> um, but but it, yeah. So it, I turned twenty one in Boston, and when I was in college, so I remember that. So it was the year possibly two after that, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Can I now listen? My style. Sometimes I can't remember. I I kind of break in. I'm not interrupting you. I'm just like so excited. You can interrupt me all you want. Okay. It's, this is your party. But because I'm so excited that you're on here, first Me of too. all, because of your show and because of our musical um, mutual friends and, and yeah. people we've worked with. Um, okay, so let me just back up. So were you uh, contributing music or music supervising, married oh. with children, scrubs, and desperate housewives? What were you all, doing on those shows? Great, all different. Thanks, because I had forgotten what were the first That's three okay. questions. Um, married with children, one of my first TV credits, I was a guitar player on... Um, Michael Andreas was the composer for the first couple of years okay. for Married with Children. And so, and a dear friend of mine, he played sax in my band, um, my local band playing in clubs in LA. And he got a TV show. So I was a session musician and played guitar. I was not a contributing composer on that. So I did that for a couple of years and it was a thrill because it was a great show. Scrubs. Uh, my best friend from college that I met in Boston, Jan Stevens, he was the composer for Scrubs. We had wow. done another show. I had assisted him on another show that he had done before that. And right. documentaries and, you know, as film composers do to work their way up. Yes. And so on Scrubs, I played guitar on a lot of the cues. Jan was also a multi-instrumentalist, so he would play guitar as well. 
Uh, I did some arranging. I wrote some horn arrangements and things like that. We did, there's one episode, if everybody remembers it, it's a complete musical. Not a word is spoken. The whole look up got, scrubs wait, we gotta, the I, musical. I, I, I got to, oh, I'm going to look that up. Yeah. It's, oh, you would love it, Deborah. And so every actor sang every line, every question, every answer. Uh, and so I wrote an orchestral arrangement for one of the pieces on that. But I used to, uh, I co-wrote some cues, you know, along the way uh, for that. But Jan was the principal composer every once in a while. When you work closely with a composer and they trust you, every once yeah. in a while when you're up until four in the morning trying to hit the deadline, you get the opportunity to stay up all night <laughs> right? and and write a piece of music uh, that fits, you know, what the, the composer needs. So, so I did, so it was kind of all of those things. Um, and I did it for, from the, the very first show all the way through the end. There were other guitar players that played along as well, some of who I recommended, um, you know, just because the composer had asked me to. Right. Um, and again, serve the music, serve the artist and serve the show. Um, and then Desperate Housewives, that was an acting job <gasps> where I was acting, but not uh, with with the deepest respect to all of my actor friends, sidelining. So, and I was on it. I think I did, I know I did too. There might, I, it feels funny to say, I, I'm not sure because because I don't take no, for granted okay. any of this, but it was uh, quite a few years ago. But I think I was on three episodes where I played a musician, no lines, but I was in a scene where they needed a musician, either, you know, like I played, I was the guitarist for Bree's wedding, you know, like things like that. Oh so you're you're in the shot, you know, and and people see you, and you need to 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 still play the music. I I treat it as if I'm playing it live. They send you the track, I learn it. The fingerings are accurate. Oh, so yeah. I hate it, when actors, I can't stand it when they're a, not. I'm looking at that like, oh, why didn't somebody tell them how to do this? That's yeah. right. Or hire a musician. So so if a, a director wants to get a close-up of my hand, it's there. I'm doing it as if I was really playing it. Uh, so I ended up doing these different episodes where they, they'd had one where they were in a recording studio and they needed a bunch of people like, Hey man, how's it going? You know, that kind of, yeah. <laughs> musician talk, musician talk or look. So, so desperate housewives was, was all uh, same thing with Larry Sanders show. I was in oh, the house that which was a thrill for me because it was such a brilliant show. It was so, that can I show say, was so brilliant. Can I say, can I use profanity on your show? Oh, God, of course. It was so fucking funny and smart. It was yes. because, and I knew because I had worked on two late night talk shows. So all of those things that they would make fun of, those are things that really happened, just amplified, magnified. But the the last year of the show, I was asked to be the guitar player in the band on camera. Oh, God. Sidelining. Again, sidelining. But it was just magnificent. <laughs> that is, you know, a mutual friend of ours. That's like Edie Lehman. Yes. Who was that star of General Hospital. So right. got, got asked to play the piano on yeah. one episode and then became this concert pianist character on yes. General Hospital or something. Right. And she's a magnificent singer and vocal contractor for those yes. people who don't know who Edie yes. is. Yeah. Edie yeah. Lehman Boddicker. Good friend for a very, very long mm -hmm. amount of years. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. I And by the way, Deborah Hurwitz, I'm responsible for being the associate conductor on Broadway of Jersey Boys because of Deborah Hurwitz, and we'll talk about that. That's where I first heard your name. Yes. Oh, through Deborah. I love it. Yeah. All right. Now, I want to talk about your own work as an artist, which you talked about in the beginning. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so... um when did you get to this point where you said, oh my God, I'm having so much fun doing things for other artists. Now I'm going to be, I'm going to put out my own music. What year was that, first of all? Well, it was 1988 that I put out my first album, my first solo album, Bimini. Bimini, um, that's right. Yeah, which is an island uh, yes, off of I'm, the coast of Miami. And I was born and raised in Miami. So for the trivia right. question, what is Bimini? Yeah. What is Bimini? <laughs> yes. And on Bimini, so you had made enough... <laughs> Exactly. You had made enough connections at that point, do you think, where you were able to put together a band, or were you like studio musicianing it, where you say, this song would sound good with this art, with this drummer and this bass player, and how did you put it together? It was a combination of the two. I, I put a band together for the two days of recording the entire rhythm tracks 
and then we did some overdubs, you know, along the way. But I, I needed because first album independent, you know, borrowed the money. A, f- a friend of mine. And we actually, didn't have home studios, really. No, no. So everything was expensive. You had to go to a 24-track studio. That's right. Um, a friend of mine who, this is a great story, uh, Perla Battaglia, who was a magnificent singer, longtime friend, who people might know through her work with Leonard Cohen for all the years that oh. she sang with Leonard. Um, and she's still keeping his music alive and, and touring the world. Um, we were friends. We played in each other's bands and, you know, did all the, the things along the way and came up together. She came up to me um, in 1988, essentially, and handed me an envelope with $1,000 cash. And she had a day gig at the time. She was singing in clubs, but still working in somebody's office. And and sh- I said, what is this? And she goes, it's the the it's the first payment for you to do a record it's time for you to make your own record oh and, she gets a fanfare yeah she Thank definitely you, gets a fanfare i'll never forget yeah. that and she said go get the rest of the money and make the record it's time for you to do that so she was i i was had been thinking about it and and wanting to do that knew that i could and didn't right. want to wait around for it to happen so i went and borrowed the rest of the money from people and they were loans and I promised everybody, I said, I will pay you back within one year. Here's the, we worked at the interest. Did you? Here's the, you did, didn't you? You paid them back. I did. I yeah. love And that. I said, even no matter what, if I have to wash dishes, I will pay you back. So I, I promised that I will. And I did and signed a contract with everybody just to make it, you know, a deal memo. Yeah. But of course, but, but the thing is the question, the way you posed it, you know, did you, you were saying you played with all these other fantastic artists and and the, and then you decided now I want to do my own. That's not really how that came about. Oh, and it's wow. I I moved to Los Angeles. Yeah. I the first year you do everything that you need to do. I got a, a job parking cars at the Playboy Mansion and and then on the weekends and then I was playing in every band and auditioning and every demo and you know what you do. And the advice that I was given to play for everybody, play on their play on their demos, play on their records, right? And play in the club and do all that. So I was doing all that. Um, I had these two remarkable opportunities where I started working with Joe Sample and the Crusaders, oh. um, working with them, basically assisting Joe, who which is how he became my mentor. I ended up playing on one of their records, which was sort of, I mean, it was a thrill, but it was an aside because I was there like arranging young, you know, can you? check the chart and make sure get everything off to the copyist. Yes. Or, and we and didn't some, have we didn't have computer generalized. No. We didn't have finale Sibelius. You were doing it by hand. I just want yeah. everybody to know this. Go ahead. Yes. Or drive and no fax machine. So or driving at, you know, after the 10 p.m. session was done, getting in the car and driving with the handwritten charts yes. across to the to the other side of town to get it to the copyist who stays up all night. And then and I go still isn't using a computer. Right. All by hand. And all that. So I was doing all of that. And then I got this Billy Preston tour and I went to Europe. I mean, you know, I mean, wide eyed and bushy tailed. I was like, oh, this is it. It's my dream. That's what I dreamt of doing and go to Europe and and toured around and played with this rock star, essentially. And yeah. yeah, And basically got thrown into the fire, you know, learning how to fend for yourself and and everything, you know, And, and then came back and I couldn't get arrested. Because I thought, well, oh, because great. you left, and they go, oh yeah, he's on tour. That's right. This always happens. This happens in our business all the time. You exactly. Know? Yeah. So, and I thought, because oh, this is great. I've I've worked my whole life. I've trained. I'm still working. I'm focused. I'm taking care of myself. I'm being healthy. I'm I'm not being stupid and taking drugs and like and you know dating every supermodel. It was like I was my I was on the ball of just like getting to make music with the best people because, yeah. you know, mind you, I drove from Miami in my Honda station wagon from Miami <laughs> to Boston to go to college. And then I packed my champion juicer and my acoustic and electric guitar and some books and clothes and, and drove cross country to Los Angeles, you know, okay, too. So. Now, I got to ask <laughs> this question because people can ask you all these different things. We're old, but the yeah. point is oh, we're still yeah. alive, vital and working. Yeah, um, very I want to so. ask you if you had parental support. No. This is an important point. No. Okay. 
Yeah. So if it's not too deep or heavy, I'll, when I'll you said, you. I want music, what happened? A lot of things happen. Um, you know, I had the traditional taking lessons, being forced to take lessons when you're a kid because your parents think it's the right thing to do, you know, which I appreciate, but we didn't have the best music teachers, you mm. know, because my dad, my parents were both school teachers, elementary school teachers. So um, low middle class, lower middle class teacher income. And then my mom became a housewife too, you know, so s single income, three boys. Um, so, which is fine. We all clean pools and mow Where are you in the line? Where are you in the line of boys? I'm uh, the middle kid. Okay. Um, but but it, that's also an, an interesting dynamic because my older brother, who's a year older than me, Scott, was adopted. So he's first in line in the older brother. He's the first son, but I'm right. the, but then I'm the first genetic son right. of, in the family. But which was never really a, dealt with. The, not, well, no, it, it kind of, I guess it, maybe it wasn't. I mean, it was basically, we, we knew about adoption and we chose you because we love you. And so it was part of the How Are Babies Born story. So, uh, so the part of me being the first genetic child was never really discussed. Yeah, you're right, right. about that. Um, and I'm close with my two brothers. They're still around and, 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 and both of them are back in Miami actually still. And so we, oh. you know, we're close and we've gone through a lot and distance and closeness like any family. Um, so we were given guitar lessons and then piano lessons. I took clarinet in junior high school, which I sucked at. That was I not my- not know you took clarinet. Yeah, That's it was so not my, not my jam. I wanted to play trumpet, but it was a household with three boys. They didn't want trumpet in the house. Yeah, right. Um, same thing with drums. Like I took drum lessons for a year, maybe right. maybe a year and a half, but but I never. <laughs> you plotting drums she's, or right? She's a drummer. That's oh, great. Doing. Yeah, um, but my parents, um, <laughs> as I've told the story before, my parents really didn't want drums in the house, so they said, "Okay, well, you need to work on a practice pad, you know, and if you do that for six months, then we'll get you a snare." So I did that and learned paradiddles and rudiments and everything and practiced diligently right. and then got my snare and then started learning that. And then eventually I thought I'm going to be like 35 years old before I get a whole drum kit at the way this is going. So, right. because they didn't, I, I was clear. So they you really, asked for the guitar? You asked for it? No, that was something we started on guitar. My older brother and I were both forced to take guitar lessons. Right. And, you said that, but what I mean is here's why oh. I asked it again. Let me just, because this is like a real spiritual kind of a thing that I want to find out. You picked up the guitar, but yeah. you didn't have that click right away, I, right? I, I did, but I didn't have the right teacher. Okay. So that is important. And I had that click to, yeah. And I had that click to music because when we went to piano next, same thing. Like I was figuring out um, Let It Be by the Beatles. And they were going, don't do that. Right. That, that's not what we're doing. And it's like, but right. I was heard this on the radio and I was trying to figure, is this how this goes? Oh I was my like, God, you're right. It's the teacher. It's the they teacher. They wanted me to play the Volga Boatman. Right, because you know, I hear you telling the, pedal. the story. I picked up guitar, then I went to piano, no. then I went to, I'm like, wait, stop, stop, stop. Where's the click? And the click is the teacher. Right. And the click for me was the music. Like, I, I do have a gift. That's why I honor it. And, and Oh, you're, we're going to play a track, and you're gonna, okay. everyone's going to see you have a gift. Go ahead. But, but, I, but I see it as a gift. I was, yeah, it's not that I'm gifted, but I do, I've been given a gift, as you have, and so many of us have, and some people work harder than others to nurture it, and some people right. just are completely born gifted. Um, but, but the thing is, I, yeah, I kind of moved around through instruments, but I always loved it. I loved, yeah. loved, loved it, but I just was struggling with, I didn't have the right teachers oh, at okay. the time, which now is ironic because my parents were teachers, but they weren't musicians. So they bought the yeah. teachers that they could afford that would drive to the house and give I the lessons. I always offer to play, pay my nieces. Pia. I want to yep. interview the teachers. I want to, if I have, feel, if I detect talent, I have to interview the teachers. That's why I'm a great teacher. Because I, I love to teach too. I me love too. It. Because I want to inspire people and encourage them to do whatever feels right and natural. And and then I give them theory and information along the way. 
Okay, I need yeah. to, because we're halfway, believe this, look at how fast this is going. You knew this was going to happen. Okay. I did. I knew it would be fun I want to talk about the single. I'm going to backtrack to all my questions yeah, yeah. that I have. But let's talk about this single. So when I was in, in the 1970s and I first heard this song, right? Um, yeah. What, what is Hip? You can hold it up again. Um, what is Hip by Tower of Power? I was freaking out about this song. I'm going to tell, I don't want to give away too much because I want to talk about your version of it. Right. So you as an instrumentalist, of course, the original What Is Hip has phenomenal lyrics. Oh, it's amazing. And yeah. I'm going to go, I want to ask you an opinion. Or something Written I, also, I, can I shout out Doc Kupka, Doc yes. Kupka, Emilio Castillo and David Garibaldi are the, the writers. Of, I love um, when you give credit where credit's due. I'm very bad at that sometimes, and I get mad when it doesn't get done for me. Well, so they wrote that you. iconic song, and everybody in Tower Power who played the crap out of it, that this iconic song that we all love. Yeah. We got to talk about that bass part in a minute. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Because that was... I'm, I'm going to play Terry Woolman's version. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but okay. you have to get it, okay? What is hip, okay? To the Terry Woolman version. And do you just... Go by Terry Woolman or the Terry Woolman band. It's, it's just Terry Woolman here. That's on Apple yeah, it's, it's me, Terry Woolman. It's you. Did you produce it and yes. everything? Okay, oh, so I produced produ and I wrote the you, horn arrangement. You, I yeah. You did yeah. everything. Here we go. And remember, he's a guitarist that effectively, this is what I feel, took the essence of the lyrics of the song, not just the music, and put it in to this version. Yes. <laughs> if you can hear the guitars are going back and forth. I can't, I gotta move. Me too. They have to play more than I usually do. What's happening? I'm. Woo! Wow. Okay, so look, everybody can. Uh, everybody has to clap for that, and including me. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. I it means a lot to me. Thank you. I just want to say, you know, yeah. I've worked with George Clinton. I've worked with those. Yes. I've worked with the Brecker brothers. I wrote right. a song you know, with Randy Brecker. You know. You know horns and funk. I know horns and funk. Okay? Yeah. That is so friggin' funky. And although the bass player's not playing exactly what was on the original, he's he's doing an ode to it in his own friggin' funky way. Can you tell right. us who these players are? Because I'm losing my mind. I can, and I'm so excited to tell everybody who they are. And I also want to tell you, because you totally get it, um, as you just totally understand what I did here. And so I wanted to honor the the guys in Tower Power because I love them. Oh. And I love the band, and I have so much respect for them. And as a matter of fact, their horn section played on my first Bimini record on two songs. Wow. So, so we actually even have some history. Um, so, the, So the thing is, I didn't want to do a cover of it. That's already been done. Nobody does it as well as are, are they've ever done. Are you insulted that I called it a cover? I'm so no. sorry. No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. It is. Um, I wanted to find my own unique, put my own okay. unique spin on it. No, I'm not insulted at all. I wanted to honor the original version, but I also wanted everybody to be themselves. So I told the bass player and the drummer and everybody, and I'll tell you who they are in a moment. I said. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we're not copying the song. This is a new version. Yes. My goal, intention, is to honor them and maybe create a new definitive version. I know that's a, a lofty goal, but that was the goal. You did it. So, thank you. 
That's Thank why you. I think everybody should get this. I'm serious. If you have Apple Music, Spotify, anything, at least get the album, but get this What Is Hip. Yes. Because you need to just get it's it. It's streaming and downloadable everywhere right now. It just got released uh, two weeks ago, and it's already on the most added on the Billboard charts and the smoothjazz.com charts. It, I'm thrilled. Yeah. Unbelievable. So the musicians, because you said, so you did everything. It's like, well, no. I, well, I, I know. Assembled. Yeah. You assembled. <laughs> but yes, I did. I arranged and produced the song and play. Who are these horn players? We can start with that. That horn, well, the melody horn is New Yorker Andy Snitzer. Okay, so that's fellow why it New says Yorker. featuring Andy featuring. Snitzer. Yes. yes. And and so Andy is the featured sax player. He and I share the melodies and solos. And I right. really wanted to, to feature a sax solo. It felt yes. appropriate for yes. the song. Um, again, serve the music. That's why it's not the sax solo is longer than the guitar solo because that's what I heard. That's right. what I felt it needed as a piece of music. But the horn arrangement, this was all done virtually during COVID. Oh. Uh, so so the horn players are Dan Higgins on alto tenor, Barry and alto flute. He played all of those parts. There's two horn players that stacked all the parts. And okay. Wayne Bergeron on trumpet and flugelhorn. Okay. I just yes. need to say something. It was so tight that I thought yes. it was a synthesizer first. I was like, wait, no, wait. Because that's what we that's what we tried to do. But yes. it was so like, boom. It's, I was like, I had to listen it, it, like three times. Listen again now that you know that was two guys stacking all of those parts that I wrote. Okay. They're the I best like of the best in the world. From- yeah. Those that's are the guys amazing. that Jerry Hay uses for his horn section. Remember Sea Wind? Are you kidding? Jerry Hay was another person who was a huge influence on me. And as an arranger, Tower Power and Sea Wind are, that's where I learned to write horns. Besides where the notes were in school. Yeah. Yeah. Tower, tower Power, Sea Wind, and Earth, Wind, and Fire for me. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. yeah. Some of that, which is also Jerry Hay, too, you know, of for the course. later Earth, Wind, and Fire. I used so, Jerry Hay on a George Clinton album. I'll tell you that sometime. But anyway. That's, I can't wait to hear that. So the musicians, here's how this song came about. So I recorded, I came up with the arrangement. I hadn't written the horn, the horn arrangement yet. Right. But, but I writ, wrote the rhythm section arrangement, you know, with guitar and sax melody and figured that out. I recorded all of those, those percolating guitars that you pointed out in the intro. Yes. The electric guitar parts, the Can rhythm parts. Can you tell parts. people, for people that aren't musicians, so we're talking about the rhythm guitar as opposed to the solo the, guitar. The solo guitar that's in the middle that is the featured melody and solo, but mixed off to the left and the right are these other parts, keyboard parts and guitar parts. parts. And I wanted it to be really funky. And so I, I played these two different complementary electric guitar parts recorded in this room here in my home studio and did it to like a drum loop so that it felt good. You know, I found the tempo yes. and everything that I wanted. And then I added the talk box, like wait, old Peter Frampton. Wait. Yes. I want to see how good my ears are. It's one click or two clicks off from the original tempo. Am I right? Right? Wrong? What's yeah. happening? Yeah, it's yes. a little faster. Yeah. I knew it. It was yeah. a couple. Of, yes. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And I'm and I'm really like, you know, for picking keys and picking tempos, I'm just I, I'm really like the perfectionist. I want to find like the perfect right. the perfect groove for everybody to just lock in and for yeah. the audience to lock in and and like you said, not be able to sit still. So yeah. I did all of that. And then I thought, um, and then I, I reached out to my the keyboard player that I had worked on other records with who plays in my band, Greg Banning, who's a chart-topping smooth jazz artist and yes, great artist. Yes. So um, I went down to his studio and added the keyboards, you know, the clavinet and the Rhodes and the B3 yes. and everything. And then thought, okay, now I'm going to get the, the rest of the band together and we're going to go in the studio and just play live. And it was right before COVID hit, but so, you know, it was about two and a half years ago, two years ago. This is the right. longest it's ever taken me to make a record. Of course. Um, and and to make it feel the way it feels, as yes. if we were all in the room together. But my friend, Will Lee, who is another <gasps> New York musician. He's one of my friends, too. What are you talking he about? Is. We got- <laughs> so Will had reached out. He's the he's the bass player on this track. So, I can't take it. I got to text him. All right, yeah. Go ahead. So Will had reached out just to say, "Hey, Sandrine and I are going to be in L.A. for two weeks or to do some some business and and uh, let's have coffee." You know. So we, you know, my wife and I said, "Yeah, absolutely, that'd be great." And then 
And then I thought, well, maybe Will would be available to play on this. <laughs> so I asked him because I thought he'd be great for yes, this. Yes, he would. And, and, and he, he is was. great. He's perfect. And so I we got together and went to John Robinson, J.R. Robinson's studio. He's the drummer who plays on my records and has played on – all these guys have played on everybody's records and hits. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so we got together and played live bass and drums with Willie and J.R. in the J.R. studio, which is set up for that, and we added bass and drums. So I that brought it. the live element to what we already had, which was kind of live anyway. You know, so, yeah. and then, and it came out great. It was amazing. And just, you know, it had all this fire. And again, I said, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like for bass, we're going to get specific for a second. You can still play the 16th notes that, that Rocco played yeah. on the original, but don't just do that. Be you. I want this he, to yeah, feel. He deviated. He deviated. And yeah. it was, it, well, I should have known Will. My God. Yeah. So, so, and same thing with JR. It's like, <sighs> you don't need to play David Garibaldi's part, the drummer from Tower Power, who right. is one of the best drummers in the world. But right. I just thought, well, if I wanted to do the original, I would get David. You know, I would right. ask if he would play it and, and hopefully he would say yes. But I thought, I, I want to put my spin on it. So I, I want to bring in new blood and bring my interpretation, my vision to life and let everybody truly be themselves. So that's how that happened. And it's and then, it's an ironic song because the lyric yeah. is so ironic. The, everybody, they, the song is hip. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. What is hip? So, and they're, they're saying, the so you want right. to jump out of your trick bag and ease on into a hip bag, yeah. but you ain't just exactly sure what's hip. So you start to let your hair grow, spend big bucks to copy a wardrobe, but somehow you know there's much more to the trip. Yeah. What is hip? What is hip? And by the way, <laughs> when I was recording the melody, what do you think was on my music stand? The lyrics. I love that I knew that. Because then, I, you know, it gets to the end. The irony of the end is... uh. What is hip today might become Come passe. passe. Yeah, yeah. It's just for a bunch of fusion <laughs> jazz people to write this lyric. It's theatrical. Yeah, isn't it? It it, and, it has an arc. You know what I mean? And it, this is the I do, and and that's why I think we're all just drawn to it. It's it's yeah. got sweat and guts, and but but it's the the lyrics are so cool. It's so the lyrics are so hip, and but the thing is. This coming up sometime in this next year is the 50th anniversary of the song being written and released. Oh, you are so Can smart, you believe that? that? that well, I didn't wonderful. even know that. I didn't you even didn't know, know that. You didn't know that? No, it was this was not like, oh, that's clever. Why don't you I it's just sort of an extra Scooby snack about it that we get to just bring more love to the song and more attention to oh, it. I love this. Also, I want to just say something if I scrub ahead. And I want to tell you who else played on the track. Oh, please do. Before I, I forget. So, so Will, Will Lee, John Robinson, and then, then this weird pandemic started hit and none of us were really knowing what to do. And it's like, yeah. maybe, maybe we shouldn't be in the room together and let's just be careful. So I reached out to Luis Conte, the percussionist. Right. He's got a home studio and I've recorded this way with him before he added his percussion remotely. And then after that, I reached out to Andy Snitzer. And and, and, I, he and Andy re recorded his part in his home studio. And then after that, I wrote, I reached out to Wayne Bergeron. And I said, I want to do this horn arrangement. And Wayne, boy, this is something. There's a lot of life that you hear in this song too. I do. And so Wayne... Uh, said, well, we would need to do this quickly because he developed throat cancer. Oh, my or God. I, and so so he was getting ready to start radiation. I said, Wayne, I'm going to wait for you. Because he said, what's your deadline? I said, there is no deadline. It's, it's COVID. Well, that's just, what happened to us in COVID. We found new ways to do things. Yes. So I, I said, Wayne, this... Just get better, right. get better, and this is something we can look forward to, and we'll do it when you're better. I and love that. So, that is, and it was I, still COVID when you know when he got better. So instead of going in the studio and putting the whole six piece, eight piece horn section together, 
Yeah, he we said, basically, I'm just gonna, yeah, we 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 did it at home, like we've been, like we did that, and that prompted the rest of this record. There's a whole record that's coming out next year that's called Surface. This oh, is the first great. single, and this is me literally underwater. This is not Photoshop, and and basically, to to me, it's about. Well, what I wrote, because I was asked to write a quote for the record, in many ways, making this album has been an awakening for me. You have to dive deep before you surface. And this whole deep dive into, into the world stopping, this, yes. this global reset. Yeah. And so, you know, this is part of how I surfaced through that was by figuring out, well, okay, I just did this song, let me just keep going. And I, I created a whole record that will be out early next year uh, with collaborations it. of the same magnificence and intention. And, you know, where people just really like sounding like you're all in a room together. But And some of the musicians were in India and in the Netherlands and all over the this country. Is, and Yeah, this yeah. is what happened. So that's the answer to that question. Oh, my God. I want to get to so much stuff, but I also, if you wouldn't mind talking about it, your wife, who I've worked with, yeah. who's a gem of a person and <laughs> talented, um, I found a track, a couple things that you guys did together. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. And yeah. And um, this one is such, she sounds amazing. I think this is the one where she hits a C sharp, <laughs> low C sharp. Is this the one? Oh. Listen to him and his wife, Melanie Taylor. Terry Woman and Melanie We recorded Taylor. this live. This is live in my studio. Oh, my. oh, I love this guitar part. Thank you. I, this is so gorgeous. This was inspired by James Taylor's version of this song. And here comes Melanie singing low C sharps. I don't know what's going on. Children see him lily white. Oh. The baby Jesus born this night. Some children see him lily white with tresses soft and fair. Some children see him bronzed and brown. The Lord of heaven to earth come down. Some children see him bronzed and brown with dark and heavy hair. Now, first of yeah. all, can we just talk for a minute? <laughs> okay, can we? Yeah. <laughs> Melanie Taylor. Because, you know. I love this concept of some people see him different yeah. ways. First of all, I'm a Jew boo. I'm a Jew. Me too. Jew what? Yeah. yeah. I'm a Jewish Buddhist. Okay. Oh, I'm not. A, I'm sorry. I'm Jewish. I'm not okay. a Buddhist. So, and then you have a black wife, correct? Yes. Yes. And you have this beautiful lyric about how people see Jesus, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that right? Seeing him so, as a, a brown skinned, beautiful, yeah. you know, inspirational. I just, yeah. I just think this is so beautiful to put yeah. out and decide on a song that is going to say that, you know? Yeah. I just, I, I came, I was listening to a lot of, so I played What Is It, fantastic. Then I thought, were you married at the time to Melanie? No. How no, we got, long ago was that? That's, uh, we have to look, I can look it up right now. It's it's okay, on my because I didn't my do album. that kind of research. It's a joyful noise. It's my Christmas album. Yes. And there's a picture. It's an all white. It's my white album with a red guitar, but it's everything right. white clothes, white background. Um, and so just go to my website or iTunes or Spotify or anywhere and you'll yes, find it. A joyful noise. There it is. A joyful folks, noise. Some children see him. Yeah. Which is just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, okay. So I. This is what happens to me. Look, uh, this this may have to go a little bit over because I usually do Q&A at the end. Yeah. If anybody has Q&A, uh, please come up. Um, but I'm going to keep talking. 
because I want to try to get in as much as I can with Terry. But if you do, just just ask to come on stage, and I will t- uh, bring you up. Absolutely. Um, all right. I want to tell you a Herbie Hancock quote, and I'm from, I'm sure you might have heard it, but I once was at a place where someone asked Herbie, how do you become a great musician? And he said, become a great human being. Oh, right. And yes. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah. I just, I really, and he practices the same type of Buddhism as I do, by the way. <laughs> um, and so, you know, let's say there's somebody listening to this on a replay. I don't know. There are not a lot of people here, but I appreciate this whole audience is here. What would you say to someone who said that to you? And I mean, don't try to compare yourself to Herbie, but like, how do you become a great musician? Um, is it? Ju- it's not just just about practicing, right? It's about listening. What do you think it is? Well, first of all, I agree with Herbie absolutely. Yeah. And and I've heard Quincy Jones says the same thing. Right. Be be a good person, and and I that is something that I strive to be is just you know to leave the world a better place and and in right. every moment a you know a better place every opportunity to do that. Uh, it's kind of like even when we were growing up and learning about camping and stuff and you learn to like you you pack out your shit you leave you don't leave garbage in the woods right. you you leave it more pristine than you found it yeah you know, so um but i w- i would say there's an there's an incredible amount of discipline from from my life you know right um Ooh. discipline involved uh in practicing your craft and yes. the craft as we wear many many hats you know there's like there are not enough hours in the day you know, for me to stay on top of, you know, on my mandolin chops and my guitar and piano and arranging, it, it's just not physically possible uh, for me. I haven't been able to figure that out. But just to be the best uh, musician that I can be and listening, being curious, yes. being curious, being staying open, stay right. open heart, open ears, open heart, um, and really care about what people are saying or playing. So, because it's a dialogue, it's a communication. And, and I'm a big believer in the space between the notes. Like not, <gasps> not we can always have a having, whole show on that. That's, yeah. that's groove and funk right there. That's right. It's where not to play. And it's where yeah. not to speak too. Like when you're having a conversation, if we kept stepping on each other the whole time during this conversation, we wouldn't have said, we wouldn't have gotten to the, the, the layered, answers and questions that that are being asked here yeah because you know okay i'm gonna i i know already know the answer the answer is no for me but i'm gonna hear what the answer is for you can you teach people grooves how to groove wow i mean it's a really hard question because i teach a lot of things but can you teach funk can you teach grooving i think so because i was taught it, I mean, my my time wasn't. I, I think it's not about just time. It's feel. okay. Feel, yeah. I mean, you're right. The discipline of pocket, and you know, with with finding your place within a metronome, and that discipline of being able to play right in the middle of it, right on top of it consistently, right behind it consistently, you know, without dragging, that can be taught. But the rest, no. I think it's in you, and I think I. I I think that's like, you know, when we think about back, like the first time we were like, just like mesmerized and hypnotized by music and, you know, and, and my story, uh, one of them is, because I've been asked that in interviews over the years too, and I'm sure you have, is junior high school, we're out running track, we're in, out in the field, it's phys ed, it's that hour of the day, and I hear this music drifting from across the field, because there was some limo driver just parked in the shade cleaning the car you know sitting on the dock of the bay you know cranking through his limo speakers coming through the air and oh. i literally walked across the field towards the music right. like a zombie you like, like a what zombie is, i needed like a moth to a flame i needed to be near it i needed to hear what that was be in that and being you know you know hundreds of yards away the groove was what pulled me. It it just reeled me in like a fish. So yeah. I think it hooked something that already existed, that yeah. was deep inside of me that I didn't know was there. Yeah. So I I do believe that I really I mean, do. You know, you play yeah. with George Clinton, so I mean, yeah. There's like, 
you know well, you know what, what it's like about to say what it takes he, to fit in. He defi- I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you trying to get it in so quickly. If you want to say it again, say it. I just get so excited. Go ahead, and then I'll you, finish. You you learned what it took to fit in, to to be the part of that piece of machinery of that that groove. Well, you know that funk. Yeah, two, two things happened to me early on. I was playing one of my songs for the Brecker Brothers back when, and Michael Brecker said, "Oh." I knew you had good time from the moment I met you. I didn't even have to hear you play. Because, <laughs> you know, just a, a, a funny thing. Yeah. Okay. The, what you said about our nuance and our speaking. Yeah. But the other thing is that um, they interviewed George Clinton on a broadcast that I listened to when I was working with him. And they asked him what the definition of funk is. And he said, anything it needs to be when it needs to be that thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, what I, I understand would love, the vagueness of that. Yeah, it's great. And, and so that, it's you know, crystal clear. It's not clear. just music. It's not just music. It's you could be a funky person, but fun, you know, this and that. That's right. It's like you have to be anything it needs. Yeah, exactly. I have never gone over, but we're gonna go over five minutes here because okay. I gotta like get to this. Um, I wanna scrub through to the solos. You know, we really are promoting this single. Everybody, yeah. what is hip? Featuring Andy Snitzer, and it is Terry Woolman's single. You can find it on all platforms, right, Terry? Yes, everywhere. Anywhere you can stream music, it's there. Okay, I'm going to try And download. Get- yeah. Woo! Let me just explain to people. As this is going on, what Will is doing is double stops, which means he's playing two notes at the same time. Yeah. And that, I don't want to dissect. Here's the Terry solo. Back and forth. Andy Snitzer, everybody. One and only. Alto flute and flugelhorns. Yes. I have to finish this. (laughs) I hope no one minds. I got to finish this out. Organ, Terry playing organ. Greg Manning. Oh, Greg Manning. Watch out. Here. Blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> Reference. <laughs> Woo! Chromaticism, everybody. Chromaticism. <laughs> sea wind influence there. Yeah. Can we take it home? Okay, now we can clap. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Woolman. <laughs>